Oh, it's so good to see you all again. It's the final part of our series, The Story of Justice. Here's a question. You ever felt frustrated? Do you ever felt disillusioned? Do you ever felt cynical about the state of the world? Do you ever wonder and ask the question, why is the world so broken? Why does it seem so resistant to change? We had Black Lives Matter. We had Me Too. Back in my day, we had Drop the Debt. We've had all these things where we thought the world is about to change. And then six months, 12 months, two years down the line, everything's just the way that it was. Sometimes it's got worse. Evil, injustice, it seems incredibly resilient to change. It seems that no matter how much energy that we get, black People are still being prejudiced against and violated. Women are still being treated unfairly, unequally. The world is still a broken, unfair, unjust place. We have more violence. We have more hypocrisy. We have more corruption. We have more deeply entrenched issues. And it can be so challenging and so tiring and so disillusioning. And if you're working for justice... If you have any modicum of energy and passion in your body that says, I want to make a difference in the world, it's so easy to lose heart, to lose energy, to lose hope. We're talking about justice in this series. We're talking about the fact that the Bible is not just a story about how God wants to come and be your personal savior. It's about how God in Christ Jesus is changing the world and making it the way that it's supposed to be. But how do we carry on when it seems like nothing much is really changing? What we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at one book in the Bible. The last two weeks in this series, we've looked at the Old Testament. Now we flip forward to the New Testament. We're going to look at the book of Revelation. Revelation, it's a translation of the Greek word apocalypse. Everyone say apocalypse. Apocalypse. When you hear apocalypse... You think uh, science fiction, end of the world, cataclysm, weird stuff, freaky stuff, frightening stuff. Actually, the Greek word apocalypse just means an unveiling. It means a drawing back of the curtain. It means literally a revealing, a revelation. This is what's happening. And Revelation was a book written to the early church to give them hope, to show them what God is doing behind the scenes. Spiritual things we don't normally see. And we're going to go through and have a little look at the book of Revelation. And if you've ever looked at the book of Revelation or heard about it or talked about it or read it or thought about it and found it difficult or challenging or weird or distressing, we're going to go through some stuff and we're going to give you a little bit of an insight, a revelation of revelation. We're going to unwrap the pages and and give you some keys to understand it. And if you're watching online, you need to stay right through to the end because at the end we're going to go and get into the very climax, the pinnacle of God's story for humanity. It is the most wonderful transformative thing. We're going to see how God is ultimately going to bring justice, not only that, but you can be involved in God's justice. So that's where we're going to go this evening. First of all, we need to do just a little bit of background. So the first session that we had, it was Shalom. In that, Sam talked about the fact that justice comes from right relationships. We talked about God's original intention, the Garden of Eden. Human beings in right relationship with one another, with nature, and most importantly, with God himself. And that Shalom, that sense of peace, harmony, things being as they should be. That was God's original plan, but we've lost it as we've shattered our relationship with God. And so in the second one, we talked about liberation. We essentially said that forces of systemic injustice, they make exiles of us all. And how God had a people who were sent into slavery, cried out, we're experiencing oppression and injustice and God liberated them, brought them out of Egypt. This this human system of oppression and injustice that was breaking their backs. God liberates them from that. But there's something, like I said, so resilient about systemic forces of injustice that they tend to just wind themselves back up again into our lives. And so you find the people of God becoming themselves the oppressors and the king that they appoint becomes himself yet another pharaoh, pressing people into forced labor and slavery. And so God exiles them. They get exiled into this iconic city empire, Babylon. And Babylon is the place of exile. 
And in Babylon, they begin to cry out, God, we need someone to intervene. We need someone to bring a savior, a Messiah. We need a brand new king. We need a good savior, someone that can bring us out of Babylon. And that's where Revelation takes up the story. It takes up the story of Babylon, but it unveils things. It reveals things. It says the reason that justice is so entrenched in our world, why racism seems to not ever go away, sexism seems to never go away, homophobia seems to rear its ugly head, no matter how much we try to progress and awake and be considerate and um, parade and march and try and work. These things, they just seem to have an innate power. And the Bible says it's Babylon. Sure, it's not the ancient Babylon, but it's Babylon by another name. For the people in the Revelation time, those churches that first received that letter, Babylon was the Roman Empire. But for us, these empires, these man-made structures and systems, they, they inculcate evil and injustice within themselves. But what Revelation does is it peels back the curtain. It opens our eyes and we see that actually it's not just human systems of oppression. It's not just human systems of injustice. It's not just human systems that have evil baked into them in an unimaginably strong way. But behind Babylon, there's the dragon. Now, the dragon is one of the things that instantly makes Revelation seem scary, frightening. But all you've got in Revelation is you've got a kind of, let me show you behind. Let me unveil the curtain. But it's, it's spiritual realities. It's another dimension. It's another uh, experience of life that is outside of our pay grade. It's outside of our comprehension. So we're going to have to be content with metaphors, with pictures, with examples. It's a bit like a kind of fever dream where you have like a bad dream. All these different scenes that come along. But if you can understand what is being talked about in these things, it makes a lot of sense. And so the Bible talks about the dragon, sometimes called the serpent, sometimes called the Satan. In other words, spiritual forces of wickedness, spiritual forces of evil, spiritual forces of darkness. Now, if you're new to faith or you're checking it out or you're kind of making your way back into church stuff, you might think that when we talk about Satan, when we talk about spiritual forces, that's a little bit Harry Potter. It's a little bit kind of crazy. But actually, the Bible says, think about it. Think about it for a while. There's a reason why human systems with people that are basically good and we want the right things and and we, we do our best. There's a reason that they can never rise out of that pit of darkness and depravity and oppression and injustice. There is a spiritual force in our reality. You just look at the world that we're in. You look at Ukraine. You look at Syria. You look at the situation in the world where it just seems to be an an unexplainable evil. You just think, why is it so bad, so wrong? The Bible says there's actually wicked, dark forces. It doesn't go into too much detail, but just gives us these pictures. And that's why within Revelation, what it's saying to us is, you will never make a dent in injustice. You will never dismantle structures of iniquity and oppression if you do it through purely human means. Because behind every Babylon, there's a dragon. The dragon is there. The serpent is there. The Satan is there. Dark forces of spiritual wickedness hold human beings in their thrall. We need spiritual solutions as well as political solutions. We need godly solutions as well as um, all the things that we can do within our frame of reference. What we need most of all is we need a king, we need a redeemer, we need a savior. We need someone who can come and bring justice. And that's why the Old Testament prophets, as they looked forward and they cried out in Babylon, they said, we're looking for one who will come and bring justice to victory. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he brings justice to victory. We're looking for the Messiah. We're looking for the King. And revelation is more than anything else, a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation from Jesus, and it's a revelation about Jesus. It's a revelation that Jesus gives to his church. And he says, this is who I am, but there's more. 
This is who you are. You get to be part of this. We're going to look at a little kind of overview of Revelation. I'm going to give you three scenes. Three of these kind of fever dream scenes that you get in the book of Revelation. And we're going to go through each of them. And we're going to see what they tell us about this coming Messiah. This King who will one day bring justice. Because unless I have a vision of what can be, I will never work towards what is right now. I will lack the energy to tackle systemic injustice and oppression and evil. Because if I don't have an idea of what God is eventually going to do, I'll always run out of steam. I will always just give up and go with the flow and just try to do my own little thing in a very modest way. But God wants to give us a vision. This is what's coming. This is what God is doing. This is what is happening behind the scenes. This is Apocalypse, revelation, unveiling, secrets made revealed. So the first scene, it's like a film scene. It is the throne room. We see the throne room of God. We see the curtains of heaven peel back and we see God on the throne. It says this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. What does it mean? Seven seals. It's not like, not that kind of seal. And what is a scroll? And and why is it in his right hand? Again, these are all just images. What does right hand mean? The right hand symbolized, particularly in the ancient world, particularly in connection with the ruler, it symbolized their power, their strength, their might, their ability to get things done. The thing that made them worthy of respect. The thing that allowed them to change the world after their own will. The scroll. The scroll would be, well, they didn't have books. They didn't bind them like we do. It was just one great big long piece of parchment that they would roll up. But a scroll, again, in ancient times, it would be the edict of a king. It would be the proclamation of the king. It would be the rule, the will, the purposes, the plans of a king. This is what the king wants to happen. But it's sealed with seven seals. So you imagine just wax seals like you get in a Jane Austen novel on, on a, a, a love letter sent to a dashing man in a white frilly shirt. Seals. Why are there seven? Well, whenever you get a number in Revelation, the number's not important. It's a symbol. And symbol, the seven is a symbol in scripture of perfection or completeness or things being totally, fully matured. So what it means is that this thing was perfectly, utterly, completely sealed up. No one could open it up. So you've got these, this thing. You've got a kind of something symbolizes the power of God and the purposes of God. But it's sealed. It's completely sealed And so John, who has this vision, he carries on. He's watching. He says this. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls? But no one on heaven, in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion. Everyone say the lion. Of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. We sometimes wonder, where is God? What is God like? What is God doing in the world? What does God care about how women are treated? How minorities are treated? What does God care about hunger or famine or unjust trade? Where is he? You may even have had things in your own life, heartache, difficulties, challenges. Maybe you've experienced injustice. Maybe you feel like the way that the world is right now, it's set up against me. It's like my parents had an easier run of it than me, but I'm in this system where it's so hard for me to get a foot on the ladder, any ladder. It feels like the game is loaded against me. Where is God? What does he think? And there's this weeping in heaven because no one can open the scroll. No one knows where is God's power. What's his plan? How is he going to change things? And then the mighty angel says, don't weep. One is worthy. It's not about being strong enough to open the seal. It's about having the right, pure character. We can't know God because he's holy and he's outside of our comprehension. But there's one 
who is holy like God, who is in essence God. And the angel says, he's a lion. He is the lion. Now, for, uh, again, an ancient audience, they were used to this imagery of a lion. The lion is spoken about in the Old Testament. The lion is spoken about by the prophets. The lion is this ferocious, terrifying, aggressive, violent, forceful beast. King of the animals. Render a part of flesh. Terror of its prey. The lion. This roaring lion. And so John hears the news about this lion, this forceful, powerful, aggressive carnivore king. And he turns around and this is what he says. Then I saw a lamb. Everyone say a lamb. lamb. Looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. This is mic drop moment. This is... John having this total about turn. Everything is just flipped on its head because he said, here's the lion and he's expecting the lion, but he looks and he sees a lamb. Not only a lamb, but a sacrificial lamb. In those days when they wanted to sacrifice the lamb, they would take a knife and they would cut its throat. And this lamb has its throat cut and the blood has spread over its white coat. And it is... Unbelievable. And he is the one that is given authority, worthy to open the scrolls. This is not about some kind of science fiction thing about when's the world going to end. This is actually about the cross. This is about Calvary. This is about what God has done. This is about how God tackles injustice. He doesn't do it through violence and force. He doesn't do it through sheer brute power. He does it through self-sacrifice. He does it through self-giving love. He does it in weakness. He boomerangs sin and evil upon itself by taking its worst and suffering it himself and defanging it and defeating it. And on the cross, Jesus gave up his life. He was the lamb that was slain, the lion, the strong ruler, the one that was expected. And yet when we see him, is not at all like what we were expecting. He is a lamb and he is a lamb slain. This is what Jesus has done on the cross. This is how God defeats injustice. He defeats it through self-sacrifice. He defeats it through unbelievable love and giving, through meekness, through gentleness, by being worthy, by taking the worst that sin can do upon himself and defeating it from the inside out. And then John says, there's more, there's more. You can find yourselves in it. He says this, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So in this scene, we see Jesus. We see Jesus unlocking and unfolding the power and the purposes of God. But we do it. We see him do it through self-sacrifice by giving his life on the cross. We see how this makes a difference in the throne room of heaven. And then John sees how actually there's held up bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. I don't know if Naomi is here, but last night at uh, the Met Gala, Naomi won an award for being at Metro Prayer. And we talk a lot about prayer in this church. We, We put a lot of emphasis upon it. Prayer isn't just something that we do to make ourselves better. Prayer is actually part of what we get to do to cooperate with what God is doing in human history. That our prayers are taken up literally before the throne room of God. There's nothing more powerful you can do with your life on this earth than pray. You think that your prayers aren't powerful. You're wrong. They achieve so much more. They achieve more than you can possibly see or imagine. They're literally held up before God by like, like bowls of incense. They're significant. So significant that in this scene describing the cross of Jesus Christ, John says, look, and here's the prayers of God's people. It's a throne room. God is showing how he defeats evil and how he comes against injustice. Then here's a second scene. The second scene, scene two. It's actually the battlefield. Now, if you, um, again, if you've heard of people talking about Revelation, and they'll talk about the kind of the final battle, the great battle, but it's, it's, it's not what we think. Here's a scene. 
John describes it. He says this, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. White horse, rider, faithful and true. Name that only he knows. Again, don't sweat it. Don't worry about the details. It's just another Old Testament prophecy. It's like all the Old Testament greatest hits, they're all in Revelation. It's like Jesus fulfills every single thing said about him in the Old Testament and the prophets. But here's the thing. Robe dipped in blood. And at this point, all the kind of the right wing zealot Christians, the guys that make us cringe and just wish that we couldn't be called the same thing as them. They all go, oh, that's it. He's got a robe. It's dipped in blood. That's right. First time Jesus came, he was meek and mild. Now he is ticked off. He is unhappy. Now you're going to see some mighty wrath. You're going to see some smiting and some smoting. You're going to see Jesus getting medieval on the world. Actually, this, again, it's exactly the opposite of what you think it is. This is all before the battle has started. Jesus shows up. He's on a white horse. He's faithful and he's true. And before a single blow has landed on the enemy... His robe is dipped in blood. It's the lamb all over again. The lamb that was slain. The blood is not the blood of his enemies. God is not vengeful. God is not here to blast the other side. We live in a world of opposites. We live in a world of conflict. We live in a world where people put themselves in different camps. And I'm going to come against you. And you're, uh, you're wrong. And you're bad. And you're evil. And you've got to be punished. And you've got to be, I've got to take you down. And I've got to fight you. And I've got to be aggressive. No, Jesus, that's not the way that he does. He comes and the the blood that is on his own robe is his own blood. It's like this is how Jesus wins the battle. If the first scene is about what God has done on Calvary, this scene of the battlefield is about what God is doing in Jesus Christ right now. That Jesus is riding out on a horse and using the power of his Blood sacrificed for all humanity. He's defeating evil. He's dismantling it a step at a time. And then we look closer in with John and we see that we are there too. It says this, the armies of heaven were following him. Everyone say follow him. him. Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Friends, people watching online, brothers, Sisters, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in this. The armies of heaven isn't some kind of, you know, angel fest and we just watch and eat popcorn while they get on with it. No, we are in the armies of the Lamb. We are in the armies of the kingdom of God. We are in the armies of heaven and we follow Jesus. That's why we say to people, the whole point of this church is we want to help people find Jesus because he's the lamb that was slain. He's the hope of humanity. We want you to love one another because that's what God has called us to do, to find shalom in our right relationship with God and our right relationship with one another and then our right relationship with nature. But then we follow Jesus. We follow him into battle. We follow him into the fight. We follow him as he comes to bring justice. We follow him as he comes to redeem all things. We follow him as he comes to make a difference to those who mourn and weep, to those who are oppressed, to those who are experiencing great unfairness, bad distribution of all the good things that God has given us. For those that are broken, for those that are mourning, Jesus says, it's good news for the poor. I have come to bring good news for the poor, to release the uh, captive, to give sight to the blind, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And he calls us in. This is why we follow Jesus and it leads us to serve the city. Find love, follow, serve. Following Jesus always leads me into serving the needs of the poor. That's why for us, it's not just, well, it's quite a nice thing. You know, we like to uh, raise money for the food bank. We like to volunteer with Beloved. We, we like to just give a little bit of uh, comfort to women caught in the 
the street sex trade and the indoor sex trade. And, uh, and we, we like to do, to do stuff with, with some of the children that are, are less well off because it's a nice. No, it is the whole heart. We follow a God of justice. Shame on me if I say that my faith in Jesus is just to make me a person that has the same life as everybody else with just a little bit of Jesus topping on the edge. Shame on me if I think that he just came to be my personal savior. Actually, he calls me to get on a horse and ride with the armies of heaven, following him. But here's the thing. We have those white robes dressed in fine linen, white and clean, which is why your relationship and your holiness and your character and the quality of your devotion to Jesus, it matters. It's not just about doing the right campaigns. It's not just about buying the right things. It's not just about getting your your weight behind the right sort of programs. It's about defeating sin by being a community, a family that is radically different, that has holiness at the heart of who we are and what we do, that we wear fine white robes. So we're with Jesus in the throne room as our prayers go before God himself. And then we're with Jesus in the battlefield as we fight for justice through right living and clean clothes, a purity of lifestyle. Then here is the final scene. Scene three, it is the heavenly city. And this is the culmination of the whole book. Guys, this is where it's all going. It says this, another scene. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Sea in scripture just means chaos, places that are uh, unpredictable and, and out of it's a symbol of, of evil forces come out of the sea there's no more of that it doesn't mean there's no more beaches and sand it means there's no more places of chaotic spiritual force I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying look God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them They will be his people and God himself will be them with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The Bible gives us a picture of human systems that perpetuate injustice, that systematize oppression. It calls it Babylon for short, a city built by people that oppresses and defaces the world. But now God promises a different kind of city, a different kind of empire. It's no longer Babylon, it's the heavenly city. And the Bible says that heaven is not about I die and I go to heaven when I die. And I leave this earth and I have an escape pod that takes me away from all the pain. No, it says that ultimately God's purpose is not for us to go to heaven, but for heaven to come down to earth. For that shalom that we had, the Garden of Eden, come back with the God of Eden. That we have the perfect relationship and harmony and and purity and the world back the way that it should be. And Jesus says, the old order of things, it is past, it is over, it is ending. Racism, sexism, any prejudice of any person anywhere, it's over over. We're talking about no more forced prostitution, no more degrading pornography, no more toxic masculinity, no more hate speech, no more cyberbullying. It's all over. Child slavery, over. Child abuse, over. Child neglect, over. No more tears, no more crying, no more depression, no more anxiety, no more bereavement because there's no more death. Cancer, no more. Leukemia, no more. ME, no more. Dementia, gone, no more. There is no more human trafficking. There is no more social inequality. There is no more oppression and hypocrisy and corruption. Global heating, gone. Pollution, gone. The rape of the environment, gone. No more war, no more terror, no more death, no more dying, no more fear, no more invasions. Fascism, gone. Nationalism, gone. Materialism, gone. Consumerism, gone. 
There's no more one percenters. There's no more them and us. There's no more uh, haves and have nots. There's no more unfair trade practices. There's no more global inequality. Homelessness, gone. Hunger, gone. Famine, gone. Poverty, gone. And Jesus says, I am making all things new. I am making all things, all things, all things, all things, all things, all things new. Because I am the lamb that was slain. I am the lion. That I am the lamb that was slain. I am the first and the last. And I am worthy. And I have the ability. And I am renewing all things. And I am redeeming all things. And one day I will make all things brand new. And I will defeat injustice fully Finally, forever and ever. Amen. And if you think that is good, you should give God a round of applause. And you should let that seep into your brain. You should let that inform your worship. You should let that inform your following of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, this is the vision that I want you to have. This is the picture that I want you to see, that in the end, all the old order of things passes away. The lamb wins. We pray with him in the throne room. We fight with him on the battlefield and we reign with him in the heavenly city. This is our future. If you're not a person of faith or if you're thinking about it, if you're considering it, you've got questions, I get that, I understand that. But you just need to know that this is what it's all about. Not a private philosophy or way of doing things that you can take or leave. We're talking about a whole new plan that God has for humankind. The kind of world that we want to see. The kind of world that we dream of living in. The kind of world that's good for everyone beyond our wildest dreams. If you're a person who is a follower of Jesus, here is the invitation for us. That we be encouraged, that we stand up, that we follow Jesus. You know, as Metro, what we want to do is um, we want not just to have serve as a slogan that we use. We don't want it to just be a niche thing that a few people get involved in and we kind of clap and applaud them from the sidelines. We want it to be the heart and the focus of our church. We want to ramp things up. Spoiler alert, there's another announcement coming later on. I I said I wouldn't say what it is. But um, someone's coming on team to give significant time to upping our game in terms of social engagement. Uh, We do Actually, we do pretty well on this. We're heavily involved and engaged in our city. And we've been doing good stuff, but we want to do even more. We want to step into the opportunities that God has given us to transform our city. In a moment, I want to invite us to pray. In fact, more than that, I want to invite us to commit ourselves to be people of justice. That means we eat ethically, we shop ethically. It means we campaign for those that are oppressed. It means that we volunteer, that we give our times, we sacrifice ourselves, we lay down our lives, we put on robes, white, clean, linen, pure, righteous, holy. We dedicate ourselves to prayer because prayer is part of it. It's not just some nice thing that we do as a little spiritual practice. It is spiritual power and force, which is why, again, there's no place I would rather be on a Thursday morning than praying with God's people because I know that my prayers end up in the throne room of God at the very center of the cosmos. But I want to invite us. There's going to be opportunities as we go through these next few months that will arise. You know, right now we have such need in our world. Food poverty, mental health crisis, all all the kind of the evils and the ills of people that are abused and used within our own city. We can do something about that. But we do it not in the way that the world does it. We do it with hope that God is going to make all things new. And we do it with righteousness and purity at the heart. We are the message. We are the followers of Jesus. We're the armies of heaven who wear white robes and ride into battle with Jesus. So here is the big idea. Jesus, the lamb, calls us to follow him in right living and loving self-sacrifice. To pray and fight for God's kingdom and justice. 
We can have confidence that one day we will see Jesus defeat injustice fully and finally. Heaven will come to earth. Amen? Let's pray right now. I want you to just take a moment and I want you to think and allow your imagination to be filled with the picture that John paints for us. I want you to see the lamb slain in the throne room of God, opening and unfolding the purposes of God. I want you to see Jesus, majestic, victorious, riding into battle, defeating evil. I want you to see the the heavenly city coming down, heaven coming to earth. I just want to, as we finish this series, I just want to give you a simple invitation. And that is for you to commit before God to this story of justice. To say, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to be one of those in the armies of heaven. I don't quite know what it means. I'm not sure what it will take. But I do know that it involves sacrifice. And I do know it involves right living. I know it involves prayer. I know it involves giving. But I want us to to respond to that. And I want to pray for us. And I want to commission us. So if you want to be part of that, if you want to make that declaration, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm just going to pray over us. So let us, uh, let's respond with that way. Let's stand and say, this is me saying, Jesus, I commit myself to following Jesus into battle against injustice to be part of that story. For some of you, It may be that you're not even sure about Christianity, but by standing, what you're doing is you're saying, actually, I'm not completely sure about all of this stuff, but I want to be, I want to take a positive step towards Jesus. Okay, why don't we just have our hands kind of in an upward position, a position of surrender. I'm going to ask that the band come back up. Father God, I pray right now that you would come upon us. I pray, Lord God, for the spirit of the Lord, the same spirit that was upon Jesus would be upon us. I pray, dear Jesus, that you would show us and teach us what it is to serve you, to follow the lamb into battle. And I want to pray, dear God, that we would see a change, a change in Jesus' name. I want to ask that we would see the power of God unfolding. Lord, I want to pray that this community would be a community that brings a total transformation to our city in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we commit ourselves to you, I want to ask that you would help us, that you would empower us. I pray that you'd inspire us. I pray that you would lay open paths for us to follow, things for us to do, people for us to love and care for, initiatives for us to take. Lord, would you do that right now in the name of Jesus, I ask. 